It's been more than a year since Bannerlord came out in early access, so I have to ask the question, is it worth playing yet? Before I start this review, I'm going to lay out some qualifiers. This is a $50 game, it'll be reviewed like it is. There's no mods in this review. Yes, mods exist, and some of them already try to fix the bad parts of the game. Finally, I'm only reviewing the single player part of the game. I will give my opinion on the multiplayer at the end of the review, but due to the human interactions experience may vary. Starting with the good news, there have been significant improvements to performance since launch, mostly in the form of crashes and stutters being squashed. They do sometimes creep back in on newer patches, but get fought off regularly. However, some of this was achieved by cutting back features or gutting AI in the meantime while they found a fix. The most notable example of this is how sieges work properly on release, if you enjoyed playing a Microsoft PowerPoint as soon as the gates got broken in. They didn't fix the stuttering, but the famous ladder bug and other bugs like units not pathing through open gates or around obstacles appeared. I can only assume that their efforts to tone down the stuttering caused by pathing issues meant pathing itself got simplified. I was one of the lucky few who had minimal issues with stuttering during sieges on the release build, so the downgrade was very much a gut punch. Along with the relentless destruction of stutter causing issues, the devs have focused on smoothing out the player experience in the form of cutting down loading times or completely removing them in some instances. In their previous Mountain Blade game, talking to another party on the overworld map would initiate an artistic take of the opposing party in a window with talking options. This was basically instant. In 1.0 Bannerlord, talking to another party would load a 3D scene as well as a 3D model for the NPC you were talking with, a massive immersion improvement but this added a loading screen. Those five second loading screens added up to a ton of wasted time, so the devs removed the 3D scene aspect. Now it's a quick load into the 3D model of the NPC you are talking to, as well as a lower quality screenshot of a scene for the background. I still think this is overall worse than how they handled it in Warband, but it may be a temporary fix while they get new background artwork made for those purposes. There's a pretty long list of improvements, so I'm going to list off a few others. If you want a full list of improvements, I'll have to direct you to their patch notes because I don't want this to turn into a day long patch note reading session. Alt left click to follow was a sorely missing feature that makes the escort quests drastically more appealing to complete. Being able to select which allied parties keep visible on the map means keeping an eye on what new crazy and bad ideas your assigned leaders have gotten themselves into. You can set a limit on the salary of a party so that they don't hire the most expensive units and make you go bankrupt. The ability to set a party to be neutral, aggressive, or defensive. I haven't had much experience with this, but anything to stop your newly founded 40 man group from running straight off into a war is a relief. Being able to select which units go into a hideout attack. No, seriously, this was and still is a disaster of a mechanic in my opinion. Even though you have a thousand man strong army, you can only bring 10 men into a hideout battle. Then if you lost, you automatically lost your entire army as well when you were captured. Now I'll move on to some more welcomed additional things that were added in patches. They added many pieces of new equipment. I'm always a fan of form over function when it comes to gear. Fashion Souls, Fashion Hunter, Fashion Skate, World of Fashion Craft. Okay, I'll stop. The brace stands for spears, which was added as an additional counter against cavalry that were overperforming in fights. Spears already caused horses to stop and rear if you hit their front, but it seems this wasn't enough for balance. As far as I know, this is still only in multiplayer, but it's supposed to go into single player at some point. I saw a spear with a reference to the stance while playing for this review in single player, so maybe it's about to creep its way in if it hasn't already. A ton of unique scenes were added for the villages and castles. A scene is the map that you play on when in the 3D world. Right now, only villages, cities, and castles have their own unique scene. The open field battles have a handful of generated scenes that match the theme of where the battle is happening on the overworld map. The devs have teased a new system that will properly match open field battles to the overworld map, which is something to look forward to. There has been a significant increase in the number and kinds of quests Notables will give you. It went from what felt like 7 total quests on early access release to 30 or more. Quests also used to only be given out at stationary places, but now lords will hand out quests while traveling or in an army, such as a need for horses and hiring you to acquire more for them. It still gets repetitive if you're trying to max out your reputation, but the act of completing quests is nowhere near as monotonous. Something I really enjoy is that they added a sandbox mode that starts you in the game without the main quest pushing you along the path to make your own kingdom or supporting another. I'd almost recommend everyone play in sandbox mode, but the main quest does exist as a guiding hand for those that struggle to make their own fun. If you struggle with open-ended games, I'd recommend the proper campaign. It's a pretty weak guiding hand, but at least it's there. I'll be getting deeper into the game, and I'm afraid the rest of this will tend towards criticisms around the state of the game and its mechanics. Bannerlord has an economic system. For example, if lords want to upgrade their troops into horsemen, they need to buy horses to do so with. Horses are spawned at horse-producing villages, which go on periodic trips to a city and sell their horses at the marketplace. Then a passing lord will buy said horses. The less horses in stock, the higher the price. This is supposed to incentivize the player in caravans to form supply chains across the map. This system was completely broken on release, often leading to snowballing kingdoms to take over the entire map in a matter of several gameplay hours. 
Many band-aid fixes were added, such as castles never starving out when they had no food, as well as lords spawning with a free set of troops because they would get stuck in the death spiral of not having troops and being caught by bandits making them go bankrupt after they lost a single battle. This means short of beheading every enemy lord, there's no way to stop them from constantly attacking you with 40 fresh recruits a few minutes later. Some of these band-aids have been removed, others still exist. The market system seems to have serious issues with stock and caravans never truly capitulating on shortages. I don't know if this is because the AI merchants also have the fog of war limitation like the player causing them to prefer a loop of up-to-date prices. This lack of change is a surprising limitation when you view the system as a whole. Like one small part has gotten jammed up causing an entire clock tower to stop working. About that fog of war system. If you didn't know, when you visit a city, it updates the prices on goods at that city. When you mouse over trade goods at another city, you can then see the prices at the other cities you visited. There's even a perk that allows your caravans or shops to update prices for you in the cities they visit or are at. It's an engaging system for those that want to play as a wandering merchant. Yet without player intervention, certain cities never catch up on their horse stock. You can quickly find a demand supply loop that will last the entire game. If the lords of that kingdom aren't cheating, then their cavalry numbers will slowly dwindle. With a bunch of caravans roaming around, you'd expect that to change. I actually got so interested in this that I stood around waiting for villagers, caravans, and lords to visit a city and purchase or sell goods. You can see what they bought or sold for a brief second floating above the city. It's a nice touch added into the game as you can visibly see the lord in front of you buy up all the recruits right before you can. So I can't confirm that those buy sell notices do indeed reflect changes in the stock in that city. The stock products in that city seem to reflect the products of its attached villages. Grain creating villages mean the city has an abundance of grain. Another part of trading is a diplomacy system. The system relies too heavily on stats, perks, and straight RNG. Getting someone to marry you is a game of RNG. Did it fail? Well, just reload it and say the same things again. There's not much else to say about this. It exists, but it's just barely fleshed out. Recently, they've been working on getting negotiations for peace to make some amount of sense. Directly trading with lords can be just as bad. Today, a horse is worth half the value of his lands. Tomorrow, when you come back with three of them, they have no value at all. It's probably a system behind the phenomenon, but it might as well be magic. In a recent patch, they removed the level gain penalty to the experience system. So far it feels okay, consistent levels without having to rely on a mod to boost the amount of points you get. The way the system works is that you have to gain so many levels and skills before you hit your next character level. Each character level gives you points to spend that increases the skill cap as well as experience rate multiplier. Before this change, every time you leveled up, the experience rate multipliers were decreased. Eventually you hit the skill caps on all your skills before you can reach the next level and that's it. The new cultural traits are interesting, I haven't had enough time to get a true grasp on balance between the cultures. I feel as if the Batanian force speed bonus, or rather lack of reduction, is still one of the best, if not the best. Not only does it save you tons of time in the long run, but a quick run through a force can easily save you from the dreaded death spiral of losing your army and inventory because an attacker is slightly faster than you. Some of the other cultures had significant changes that will leave even someone who played before contemplating which culture to pick. I approve the changes even if the balance aspects have yet to be determined. They added a perk system into the game, but most did not work at all. And when they did get implemented, the perks did not work properly, often doing the exact opposite of what was intended or having a number off by one position, such as 0.1 versus 0.01. Those simple errors took ridiculously long to get fixed. I'm serious, some of those number swap errors languished for months waiting to be fixed when they were a quick control F away in the code. I don't want the hate on the devs, but it gives a bad look when they can't even fix that kind of error in a timely manner. Even if they knew it would be fixed because they were completely remaking the system behind the scene, a quick patch of the current system sent out to the players is the correct way to handle that kind of problem. In the present, most perks work, or specifically say they are unimplemented. With the mostly working perk system in the game, you can feel your character gain power as you level. Stronger, or faster, and with more utility, it creeps up onto you and you only notice how much you gained when you re-roll a new character. Especially true if you have death enabled. Nothing quite like going from an experienced warlord to a teenager. On the other hand, you get to personally choose the early life and stat breakdown of your offspring. Maybe start out as a warlord and train one of your kids to be a master politician. The warlord builds the empire and upon their death you take control of the child and continue to grow the empire via diplomacy and town planning. You can imagine the immersive benefits to a system like this. Upon release, quite a few units had the wrong gear or wrong stats for their gear, crossbowmen only having bow skill and various other errors. These got fixed and then the units received a bounce pass as well. I still believe some of the cultures have an objectively worse lineup than the others. However, it's close enough that the player leading any culture can succeed in taking over the map. When you can finally afford to field the best units, they are in fact better than the lower tier ones, even if it doesn't feel that way very often. The last and possibly most niche but important part of character progression is blacksmithing. You see, if you actually want the best weapon in the game, you gotta make it yourself. There's one problem though, blacksmithing sucks. 
It recently got updated and rebalanced to be easier. They added a contract system so that you can make weapons to order and the amount you get paid is based on how good your RNG rolls match their request. It's pretty boring, but the real reason blacksmithing sucks is that there's a stamina system. Every action you take uses up stamina and the only way to regenerate it is to rest. So if you spend all your stamina, run off to fight bandits for a week and come back, your stamina will have not regened at all. This means no matter what, the only way to increase your blacksmithing skill is to craft things. Click, wait for 30 seconds, and then craft more things in an endless loop until you get to the level you want. Sure, you might wait hours between crafting sessions, but you know in your heart you gotta click that wait button 200 more times wasting over an hour of your life. Apparently slowly regenerating stamina as you move around would be too strong. I hate it. You gain influence from doing things such as winning battles for enemies or otherwise solving issues. It slowly builds up as an alternative currency, as a mercenary influence gets converted into gold payments, which is a nice bonus for fulfilling your contract. This next part is for context between the 1.0 release and now. When you become part of a kingdom, you spend influence on things like raising armies and participating in kingdom votes. This initially looks like a great idea, but the follow-up mechanics spike it into the dirt. First, if you join another kingdom, you always get screwed over in the beginning because the king and other members of the kingdom pass laws that eat away at your influence. This is annoying to push through, but it gets even worse as it can add onto the death spiral phenomenon by making sure you come out the other end with no money, no loot, no soldiers, and no influence. Yet what little influence you do gain while trying to rebuild is sapped away by the kingdom's laws. My experience in the 1.6 beta is that the kingdoms do not use influence reducing laws as heavily, so it's much easier to build up influence even after you lose everything. Instead, my influence piles up uselessly as there are a few policy votes and the anti-snowball measures have reduced the amount of territories exchanging hands drastically. So I mentioned this death spiral a couple times now. It might be time to explain it. When you lose a battle and are captured, they take some of your inventory. None of the gear you're currently wearing is stolen, but you can say goodbye to that precious golden crown you just looted and forgot to put on. Then you get dragged around with no control, sometimes for actual real life minutes, before you get an event prompt. Maybe you manage to escape, or it's asking you to pay half your money as ransom to be let free. Either way, if you were captured in a war, they probably dragged you deep into enemy territory. Now you might be thinking that doesn't sound all that bad, but let me spin you the story of an experience you can have with this system. You're six hours into the game. You've just reached the cusp of when you might be able to take your own castle. You have a couple caravans offsetting your daily costs. You've built up a 120 man group of elite soldiers. On the way to the recently besieged castle that only has 20 guys guarding it, knowing that you could storm the walls without building any siege equipment, an enemy lord spots you. He's got similar numbers, but half of his troops are recruits. This troop is faster and you're forced into a battle. You easily win, only 40 of your men are wounded, none of them died capture 50 of his men and the lord himself. Wanting that sweet sweet ransom money before he escapes, you start heading back towards the nearest friendly city. On the way there, a rebellious lord spots you. You build up a bad relationship with him while working as a mercenary for that kingdom. Your men are wounded, you have prisoners and loot slowing you down. There's no way out of this fight. The lord has a bunch of mounted archers. You try your best, personally chasing down and slaughtering as many as you can, but stray arrows down your horse. You rejoin your troops on foot as they get peppered from range and eventually morale drops and they flee even though you know they will win the fight as soon as the archers run out of arrows. Facing the enemy by yourself you get beat down by a group of peasants. Captured, half your loot is taken from you and all your men are gone. As the lord drags you farther and farther from friendly territory you get a notice. Two of your caravans are under attack and you can do nothing to help them. You're both destroyed, your companions captured and held in prison in enemy cities. You get an offer to be set free if you give them half your money, but you decide you need that to rebuild. You wait it out until you escape. Now there you are by yourself. You've still got your gear and a couple horses as well as some of the loot, but it's slowing you down because you are overweight. Your speed is way too slow, so you sell some of the heaviest things to a nearby village. You pick up a couple of recruits and make your way to the nearest city to buy supplies. On the way there, the war ends. Finally, you can set off to pick up your companions from the towns they were held in. A group of 10 looters spot you. You're too slow, but it doesn't matter. You can solo 10 looters, let alone with a couple recruits, it will be fine. With the morale system, you only need to knock out a handful before they flee anyways. It doesn't matter that you're only on half health. You charge in with your map, dispatching one on your first pass, the second pass and another dead. As you turn for your third pass, you eat a rock straight to the face. Your recruits immediately flee upon your KO and it's all over. The looters take you captive. Three minutes of wandering around later, you accept the offer to spend half your gold on ransom because you fear they will drag you even farther from friendly territory. They've taken everything. All you have left is a lame horse and half your gold. As you limp away at walking speed, guess who shows up? It's the rebellious lord again. You send the couple of recruits you gathered to their death as a distraction for you to get away. It works. For about five seconds. So already back to hounding you before you make it a couple feet. You try to pay for passage, but you don't have enough. Your health is so low, it doesn't even give you the option to go down fighting. You click surrender and get dragged halfway across the map again. That is the Bannerlord Death Spiral. It's by far one of the most frustrating things I've ever experienced in a game. 
this is coming from someone who enjoys playing roguelikes. You know, those games where you die and it deletes your save, so you have to start all over? Unlike roguelikes, in Bandalore, if you don't have multiple assets in a fiefdom, it takes a significant amount of time to rebuild to the fun part again. I like to describe it as if the ocean's all dried up, someone kidnaps and flies you to the other side of the Atlantic, then tells you to march your way back across the remaining salt-filled desert. Everything you see and do on your way back burns. I'll start with combat AI in the arena. The way the AI handles arena fights is actually awful. The high risk to reward of betting on yourself is initially fun, but you will quickly notice the AI is very bad with certain weapons in a 1v1. In group play, there's enough chaos that a weapon being misused isn't that big of a deal. Each culture has their own gear sets in the tournaments which can cover up this flaw or expose it. If you join tournaments in Azurai territory, it gets really bad. You often fight one versus ones as sword and shield with javelin. Not only is the AI criminally inaccurate with the throwing weapons, but any shielded melee unit charging at you will drop their shield to wind up a swing, allowing you a free hit with your own javelin. This flaw in the AI exists in all scenarios. It's just that the arena forces mirror match one versus one so often it stands out. If it had been a two-hand weapon and javelins, I wouldn't have noticed at all. I don't think I need to explain how combat works in this game. It's the same system as the first mountain blade that has been copied in many games now. You choose which way you swing and which way you block. There's an auto block for beginners. The system leads to janky visuals, but I love it. How about larger open field battles? The AI has limited strategies during battles. If they are outnumbered, they will shield wall. If they don't have enough units with shields, they will stand there and die by arrow. Similarly, if they are outnumbered by mostly cavalry, they will use a square or circle formation with the shields on the outside. It's really cool to see, but like the shield walls, it doesn't take into account whether they have enough shields for it to be effective. It's like the AI doesn't know it can be assaulted from the sides. Generally, the AI turtles up when outnumbered. It will also stand back and stall for time if it has the superior range units. On the other hand, it will never try to flank your shield wall with its own archers. I wouldn't say the strategic AI is bad as much as it's too consistent. Always using the same general formation and tactics gets stale fast. It also never splits up its individual types of melee infantry soldiers. Skirmishers and peasants stand in the shield wall line as if they are heavy infantry. Almost all fights end in a mass meat grinder of infantry. It eventually tells its archers to charge in even though they still have ammo. It's like the AI has the proper inputs, but too few outputs to deal with fighting a human player. If you split your archers into two separate groups, it knows it needs to defend against them, but it doesn't have the proper answers to deal with it. One of the major flaws is that in a battle large enough to receive mid-fight reinforcements, the reinforcements spawn on the battlefield rather than outside the battlefield and then entering. This often leads to the AI spawn camping each other without even needing player interaction. One side will retreat and stand their ground behind their own spawn point. Meanwhile, the enemy army is spawn killing their reinforcements for a couple minutes. The individual AI can also get bad during smaller open field battles mostly for two-hand or pull-arm units. They will charge right into the meat grinder of infantry packed in so close that they cannot swing their own weapons, only to get killed by a peasant with the world's smallest mallet because tiny one-hand weapons are the only ones that can be swung. This adds a certain flavor of realism to it in large battles, but when it's 20 vs 20, you would assume the fight would naturally spread out instead of face-hugging each other with no fear of death. I don't expect much in a 500 vs 500 battle, but as the numbers dwindle down, I expect the AI to get better and better. The player can separate those units out from the shielded infantry and micromanage them to devastating effect against flanks. However, the fact remains that simply telling them to charge means those heavy shock troop type units will never put out their real damage because they don't seem to take into account the length of their weapons. Sometimes you'll catch the AI ordering a long line of units to turn or pass through your army without attacking at all, which quickly leads to a slaughter and a disappointing fight. This is clearly a bug, but it's been in the game since the launch. The most glaring issue with battles is the morale system. Units have independent values, and once enough value is lost, the army starts to break and flee, starting with the least trained units. The problem is that it happens way too fast. Sure, losing 30% of your soldiers in real life would cause a rout, but this is a game. Certain perks mitigate this effect or worsen it for your enemies. Overall, I think they don't create enough of a difference in matter. Make more units become wounded instead of dying and let the player experience a drawn out fight. You can go 30 vs 1 against looters, kill 5 of them, and suddenly the other 25 try to flee and stop defending themselves. It's ridiculous and carries through to the elite units. The devs need to at least add in an orderly retreat. As is, half the army dies when they give up defending themselves and turn around to flee. Maybe give fleeing infantry a speed bonus. Anything to allow them to disengage without being cut down for free. It's not all bad. There's a definite fun factor when it comes to the larger open field battles. Even with all the failings of the AI I just described, if you lose yourself in the chaos, it gets really good. Use the delegate command and just wander around getting into your own fights. Next is sieges. 
This has been a bad mark on the game for a long time. On release, sieges work, but were complete stutter fest as the AI pathfinding tried to calculate a new path for all units at once. Gate opened, 700 guys had to figure out how they were going to pass through it. What quickly happened was the gutting of the pathfinding AI. For months and months, it's been barely able to climb up a ladder, let alone realize the front door is open. The AI in Sieges is so bad that they've lost all fun to me. Besides the AI sending the whole kingdom after you the second you put a tent down for a siege, once you brute force your way into the battle it has no strategy beyond standing on the wall and finally retreat. No attempts to hold choke points, no secondary lines of defense, as if you were fighting an open field battle and some castle walls just happen to be in the way. It's just a meat grinder of one side running face first into another side. Don't believe me that it can still be this bad? What if I told you my first siege in the 1.6 beta is objectively worse than the sieges in the 1.6? 1.0 early access launch. That's right, the siege you are seeing play out in the background is on the most recent patch. The unit still can't figure out how to use ladders. Somehow, turning the game speed up makes it easier to use ladders, even though that would mean the AI has to make more decisions per second. You'll notice the units that do make it onto the wall are more concerned with running off to some predetermined point than fighting. At first I thought they were trying to open the gate, but as you can see they're gathering pointlessly on the wall. What's up with all those stutters you ask? Well they keep getting worse and worse until I end up going from frames per second to seconds per frame. Eventually I realized I should check what part of my PC is bottlenecking that bad, so I brought up the task manager. I expected to see one CPU thread pegged at 100%. But instead we get this nice surprise of everything dropping to about 20% usage when the game freezes. Clearly some game logic has gone horribly wrong. Luckily after a few minutes of PowerPoint simulator whatever spaghetti abomination that rose in the code begins to work itself out. Guys finally go open the unprotected gate from the inside and the freezes clear up as the massive wall hoggers start the path into the castle. Let's recap that. In the 1.0 version of the game my experience was that ladders worked, the AI was responsive and reacted quickly to breaches, but it played at a couple FPS during certain events. In the beta 1.6 version, ladders don't work. The AI is comatose and it still reverts to a PowerPoint. My first beta 1.6 siege was led by an AI, but in the path notes you'll find a line referring to a bug fix requiring you to order your men to charge twice before they actually path up ladders. Let's try a siege with me leading so I can order a charge. Here's two custom battle sieges. I removed all the siege equipment to force units to use the ladders. In this first one, it appears to be working. It's struggling to use more than one ladder per zone, but at least the soldiers are going up. Yeah, it's definitely better than my first siege. Let's try another. This one has the same problem, preferring to use one ladder instead of both, and the farther away set of ladders periodically stops seeing use at all. It honestly looks like the less soldiers press around the ladder, the better it works. Although the general FPS wasn't great during those recordings, there was no mass stuttering like the AI-led siege. Even though devs have improved sieges overall, the community favorite recommendation to knock down a wall before you begin the battle still applies. This isn't as easy as it initially appears, because you will need a large enough army to fight off the entire kingdom if you want the overworld stage of the siege to last long enough to knock walls down. The only way you're going to take a castle or city before an 800 man army shows up in its defense is by rushing into the battle relying on the ladders to work. Meanwhile, if you're defending your own castle or city, who knows? The AI might just go full derb like it did for me. There's no way to order the enemy to charge. If the stuttering starts, you might as well open your own gates to quickly end it. The devs have keys to keep system, so once you take the city or castle, you then fight the remaining enemies inside a keep. That sounds awesome, but I know it's going to be a secondary bottleneck meat grinder where none of the soldiers can figure out how to use their own weapons. A properly designed fight inside a keep will be the exact opposite of what this game excels at. Oh, and with the AI how it is, they'd all be pressed together so hard that a black hole would open up to end their suffering. This leads into the overworld map AI. My first complaint is that the overworld AI is omniscient. As soon as a single village, city, castle, or even party gets attacked, the AI knows and is sending an army. In the case of a city, as soon as you start that siege, the entire kingdom is rushing to its defense. There's no sneaky way to do anything. Even the player receives notifications the moment something falls under attack. On the other hand, caravans of roaming villagers get no help at all. When you aren't in the war, all your caravans tend to constantly get caught before they can pay themselves off, let alone make a profit. Only the player can clear out bandit hideouts. This leads to many areas of the map being thoroughly infested with bandits that can catch any villager party trying to make it to their hub towns for trading, completely stifling whatever growth system remains that hasn't been gutted because it doesn't work. Did I mention hideout fights are terrible? Follow your guys around on a wild goose chase, picking off stragglers, or just straight up AFK as they do it for you. Either way, the fight cannot end until you clear them out and you get to choose to duel their leaders or slaughter them with your boys. It's a perfectly good way to waste 5 minutes of your time. Back to the overworld map. I often corner fleeing enemies just by following them. 
Once the enemies go into the flea mode, it's like they don't look ahead at all, almost as if it calculates whatever direction is opposite of the player and goes that way until it hits a wall. The AI's pathing around the map is subpar, often passing through trees unnecessarily. This might be more of an issue with the map design as it's full of bottlenecks. In an immersive way, it's awesome to be able to hide by a bridge or in a forest to ambush the AI, but you'll get tired of it when one of your parties dies because they ran into a forest for the 20th time during a war. Basically, as soon as you yourself make it to the kingdom stage, all the AI flaws start directly affecting you. Speaking of wars, the raiding is brutal. They constantly hammer the same places over and over. It's more like a well-drawn and trenched battle line from World War I. It can take a month in-game for a villager city to recover from a raid. Meanwhile, the raids happen constantly often as soon as they are available to be raided again. You might gain your first territory on the edge of warring kingdoms like this, only to realize it'll never grow at all because it gets raided a billion times during the war, and once you sue for peace it doesn't last long enough to rebuild. I don't see any answer to this, as the easiest places to be raided will be raided. Did they just give up on the economic effects of raiding? I don't know. Finally, I've got one last criticism. In the bottom right corner of the screen, you can click on an arrow that expands the UI. In this expanded UI, it lets you see your current speed. Between judging if you can catch some bandits to running away, it's necessary at all times. Even when traveling the map, you might notice something has gone wrong only because your travel speed has dropped. This is by far the most important part of the game in the overworld map. Why is it hidden by default? So this marathon of a review is over. What's my score? I'll give it a comeback later out of 10. It's obvious that the devs are slowly fixing and improving the game, but that's the problem. It's improving at a complete crawl. On release, I'd argue Bannerlord was an objectively worse game to play than their previous Mountain Blade game. After this year of updates, I admit Bannerlord has surpassed Warband. I can't recommend it yet though. Sure, I put a couple hundred hours into the game over the course of various patches and betas, yet if I recommend the game in its current state, you yourself might be able to put a couple hundred hours into the game before any significant changes occur. For 50 bucks, I expect the AI to be able to handle a 1 vs 1 fight in a combat based game without glaring issues. Bannerlord can't achieve that yet. It's barely beyond the point of their own 13 year old game with a nice coat of paint to look at. That's not even a bad thing, sometimes a coat of paint is all a game needs. The Demon Souls remaster turned out fantastic, but Mountain Blade needs more than a remaster to be on par with modern standards. I didn't set out to put Tail Worlds on blast with this review, but I ended up with this. I have full confidence that the devs will either fix enough of the issues to make it a great game, or that they will expose enough of the game to modding that modders will fix it like a Bethesda game. The only issue is time. There's already a mass of mods trying to fix the issues with the game. Whether the devs want it or not, Bannerlord will be dragged into a good place. Play something else while you wait for that to happen. It's not worth it right now. My love affair with Warband was enough to convince me to wait for its younger sibling to grow up. I will come back and take another look, over and over until the game is worth playing. I just regret getting it right on early access release. I remembered how Warband grew into such a great game for its time, but I had forgotten just how long that took. Right after Bannerlord release, they had to pause and rewrite parts of the game engine. And then later they did so again. The devs are putting in work, it'll get there in time. If I miss anything or got something wrong, please tell me in the comments. I'll pin it to the top. If it's bad enough, I'll make a correction video. Who knows, if you just got interested in Bannerlord and the YouTube algorithm gods decided to hand you this video, it might be worthwhile to check the channel for any Bannerlord updates. Now that that part is over, I'll tell you how I feel about the multiplayer. My experiences have been great. Even in the squad based captain mode, any flaws with the AI are quickly turned into strategy by the humans leading them. It's hard to review multiplayer because the population and community is always changing, but multiplayer in Warband was tons of fun and multiplayer in Bannerlord is tons of fun too. Barring disruption by hackers in the future, I don't see how the multiplayer in this game could go wrong. If all you are interested in is some medieval combat multiplayer fun, then by all means hop in. I fully recommend that part of the game. It doesn't suffer from any of the issues with AI, economy, or diplomacy. Anyway, this video took way too long to make. If it does well, maybe I'll try to transition the Is It Worth It Yet series into this kind of deep dive. If you've made it this far in the video, I thank you for watching to the end. Farewell, and good luck with your game choices. P.S. I'll probably be covering Craftopia next.